Welcome back everybody to the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage channel. Uh, I am bringing you a uh, new installment in my sewing cabinet and table series. Uh, and <clears throat> many of you who've seen my videos on cabinets know how much uh, I uh, admire those cabinets for their quality and just the sheer premium that the consumer once paid for these. Uh, of all the furniture types out there when it comes to vintage or antiques, most of the time sewing tables don't get a lot of respect and it's unfortunate because uh, I sometimes tell my clients that the sewing tables from the vintage era are made as well or even better than a lot of the new furniture is today. Part of that is because of the way uh, consumer items used to be made across the board. I don't care if you're talking sewing machines or cabinets or what have you. And then the other reason for their uh, stout construction is that they had to hold very heavy sewing machines and they had to be strong enough for that, but also beautiful because remember the average, uh, the average homeowner in North America in say 1950, which is around when this table, give or take a few years, would have been sold. The average house was only 850 square feet. And so sewing uh, machines were often put into tables so that they could be camouflaged. Uh, it, was a, it was a convenience. Instead of having it in a case where you would carry it and store it in a closet, which is not a big deal, but some people wanted to leave their sewing machines out where they could get to them more, uh, more readily, especially if they were using them a lot. In any case, uh, these pieces of furniture often go unnoticed today in thrift shops and uh, estate sales. Sometimes they're practically given away just to get rid of them. And unfortunately, some of them may actually end up, uh, you know, in a dumpster somewhere because people just don't want to uh, give them the attention they should because they were beautifully made. Um, now, uh, this, if you recall, is the same table that I did a video on where I was showing just how dramatic the difference is or the difference can be when you use the Restore Finish product, the Howard's product that I was talking about. And... If you look, you'll see this is the half, the, uh, the larger half, where I went and used the Restore Finish. Uh, I think I did the Feed and Wax on it, I can't remember. In any case, it was a dramatic difference between this and this. Of course, this is the side I haven't treated with the Restore Finish, and now you'll see why. I, uh, I'm going to do something I've never done before. Normally, when I have a sewing table, if it is missing any of its veneers, and this, this particular cabinet, uh, for whatever reason, it could be an environmental thing where the wood got dry, or who knows what, you know, uh, uh, who knows what people have done with their sewing tables over the years. But in any case, uh, some of the veneer has, has disappeared. And um, I mentioned in the last video how to be extra careful with these tables or any piece of furniture for that matter. Uh, what you don't want to do is take uh, uh, paper towels or rags and start uh, wiping really hard because they will snag on parts of the table and they can actually cause damage. And because veneer often will lift on an edge as it, as it uh, gets old. And like right here, I'm going to zoom in and let you all see, there's an example of this right here. And I caught it fortunately because it's easier if you're trying to figure out what part of a, a, a table is stable and what part is sort of fragile, you want to do it with your finger because with your hands, you can sense things that you can't with, with a rag in your hand, right? And so notice, I, I, I think I demonstrated this a little bit before, but uh, watch, I can take my finger and very carefully, I can kind of slowly go around the edge and I can tell uh, if something's a little loose without harming it. If, you're, if you do this carefully, you can do this. Now when I do it over here, there's nothing I'm seeing that's loose and I can test it. One of the little things uh, I forgot to mention, I've got a few items here I'm going to uh, have out for this project. What we're going to do today is uh, I have a, a, the overall project is to, to repair the missing laminate. This is part of an old hair clasp or it's either a hair clasp or it was a fabric clip, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, notice I can take it and very, again, very carefully just nudge up against these edges, and those are all great. Now, this uh, side here, if I come along, uh, I don't get any lifting, so that's okay. This side, I don't even have to do that. You can see here, 
if I just push down with my thumb, you'll see where the veneer has lifted on the edge here. And we're gonna, we're gonna basically today, I wanna secure any of these loose edges. Um, bef and, and I wanna kind of make that part one of this. And then the second part, I'm gonna actually start cutting out uh, replacement pieces of veneer. And I'll show you how I did that. So for the project today, for this part of it, um, I'm going to show you what I'm using. I need something, and I just found this. It's very thin. It's metal. If you have a very fine uh, artist putty knife, or, or excuse me, palette knife, or a putty knife, you can do it. But you want something small, right? Uh, uh, you can be creative here, but you know you want something that's narrow, something that you can get the uh, the cement we're going to use for this project under. The, uh, the veneer that's lifting, you'll see this little part here where you can see right there, I could feel that with my finger and you see it's, it's already uh, coming loose, but we can still fix that. Uh, it's gonna be easily repaired, but we wanna get to it now. And uh, so what are the things we need here? Well, we've got contact cement, and you folks have seen me use this before. Uh, you wanna use this well ventilated because it really stinks. Um, this is old school contact cement. Uh, I've got two brands there. I'll use up what's left of the Duco. Duco? You can get this in hobby stores uh, or craft shops. They sometimes have this. Um, it is not rubber cement. Be sure to know the difference. Contact cement and rubber cement are not the same thing. For example, this is the tester's version of it. And it just it's just called cement for metal and wood in this case. Uh, but it's not rubber cement because that product was designed for a different purpose and rubber cement is not going to hold long term. It was not intended to. But this is, uh, it'll say cement or contact cement is what, uh, what the Duco, I believe, said. Uh, but again, you want to be in a nice ventilated area for that stuff because it, it doesn't smell nice. Um, now, what else have I got here? I've got paint brushes. These are artist brushes that I also get in the craft store. These are not like the, the ones for kids crafts that are super inexpensive, but these are also not fine artist brushes. Oh, I forgot I had this. This little set came with a, with a, a plastic palette knife. I'm not gonna use plastic because I'm not sure if this plastic can hold up to the cement. The cement could literally uh, melt it. Now, uh, I'll show you why I need uh, some of these brushes. I've got my cotton swabs just in case. You know, you know how I am with my cotton swabs. And this is like a little piece of foil uh, or you could use a bottle cap perhaps, but I'm going to use this in case I need to dip into the cement if I need to. Um, what else have I got? Oh, I have a little stack of, there's like one or two heavy books here. Uh, I've got my alcohol sitting out and a paper towel or you can use a clean rag if I need it. I don't know that I'll need it, but just in case. And most importantly, and you'll see this in the second installment once this is dried, uh, this is a little kit of <clears throat> wood laminate and it was uh, I found this in a store called Lee Valley Tools. Now Lee Valley has a number of products available, a vast, and it's not just about woodworking but they have some quite a collection of woodworking projects and uh, they sell a, a host of variety of items that have to do with uh, hobbyists I guess you'd say. And uh, I found this in their retail store, but of course you can order it online. And there may be other places you can get this stuff, but this is, I just wanted to give you an example. It's called, it's by the Sours and Company, S-A-U-E-R-S. -E and uh, <clears throat> let's see, domestic variety veneers, three square foot pack. It includes cherry, mahogany, maple, red oak, walnut, white oak. Made in USA, believe it or not. Now, um, this was, I think, a grand total of $16. And that's not bad for the variety of veneers I have. And I'm not planning on, you know, recoating the whole table. I don't want that. I'm trying to conserve the table. So I want to kind of stabilize it where these old veneers are. And uh, this, like I say, this is a first time <clears throat> project here. So I liked all of you to see me doing things, not only things I've done for years, in some of my sewing machine restorations, but I wanted you to see me doing uh, some projects that I'm doing for the first time so that maybe you'll be less, less afraid to try them. <clears throat> and again, this is not a $16 for this much veneer 
is, uh, is not bad at all. And of course, the one on top happens to be the mahogany. So again, th the idea behind this, you'll notice, of course, it's not the same color, it's unfinished, but it is the same similar grain pattern that you would see in uh, the mahogany from the past. It's close enough. And, uh, and again, we'll, we'll be working with this in terms of color, and I'll talk about it in the next video in terms of how I'm going to do that. Because matching color in wood is uh, very tricky. It's even trickier than it would be for something like paint. But, uh, but it can be done, you know, and it's, uh, why not? Why not give it a try and let's see what the results show. But for today, uh, I wanted to show you how I'm going to stabilize the veneer. So I'm going to get in a better angle for that. Okay, folks, I wanted to lower the camera angle a bit, give you a little bit better close up here of what I'm doing. So the first thing you want to do, and, and this will explain why I have all these paint brushes, what I'm looking to accomplish here is I want to get the surface of this table clean. And I don't want to, again, use a paper towel or a rag because I'm, I could very easily nick or pick one of the edges of the veneer, and I don't want that to happen. So, But I still need to get it cleaned because dust and dirt um, are, are really not great for any kind of project where you're going to have glue or paint or varnish. And any time you've ever applied those products in the fine print on the label, it will say, amongst other things, make sure you have a clean, dry surface. Well, they, they mean it. Um, and I'm going to take this. This is a fan-style paintbrush. Again, you can get these paintbrushes at, uh, I got these at Michael's, but you can get them at different arts and craft shops. They are actually not bad for what they are. I use them for touching up machines. Um, if you were a fine painting artist, uh, you know, you could certainly start with brushes like this, but many of you would use brushes that, um, that cost a lot more if you're an artist. In fact, artists, if you've ever priced art supplies, some of the really high-end ones can be, can be up there. And, but artists, um, professional artists or even amateurs can justify that. But for our purposes, we don't need to pay, you know, you don't need to pay $20 for one paintbrush. I think this whole package cost me... I think it had 25 pieces in it, and it was, oh God, I don't know, $7, $8. But again, the quality for what it is, is not bad. Most of these, of course, are going to be synthetic brushes. They're not, they're not going to be uh, natural uh, hair brushes, because those would be costing, this would cost a lot more. But we don't need it for our purpose here. Um, but I'm going to take, uh, let's see, I'll just pull out the fan brush. And uh, maybe this one. Don't pick one that's too stiff because remember, you're dealing with, um, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> this is 70 year old veneer and it's dry, and that's one of the reasons that it got uh, uh, more fragile. But that's what I'm going to do here. And all I'm doing is I'm going to take these, depending on which one I might need, just, just have a few available. I'm just going to basically come here. Um, first, I'm going to get the dust off of the top. And because these brushes are, are not overly stiff, even if I hit something like this area here that's lifted, unlike a rag or, or my, even with my hand, you have to be careful. The brush is generally, so at least as far as I've found, the brush is a lot more uh, gentle on the, on the veneer edge, right? It's it's less likely, although I suppose anything could pick it, it's less likely to, to damage it. So I may take one of the smaller ones here and kind of go in. And all I'm trying to do is I'm not washing it. I'm really just, uh, you know, unless you see any grease or oil in, in here, you don't really need to, there's not anything chemically to remove, but I want to get under the lip here because dust and dirt will have inevitably worked their way in. And that's where I'm going to be applying some of my cement. And that's, you know, one of the things I want to do is I want to have a nice, clean, dry surface so that when the cement goes in there, it's, it's going to connect the veneer to the base uh, substrate is the technical term I, I learned when uh, studying paint and how to apply paints. Okay, so I've basically gotten underneath... I'm not pulling anything out other than what's already come out here, and I've got underneath. Notice that this paintbrush is not uh, thick. It's relatively thin. 
and it goes right under the veneer fine. If it's too large, pick a get yourself a a smaller brush, one that's flat enough that can get underneath and pull out any dirt or grit. Who knows what what can work its way in there? Okay, so I see an area here that even looks a little loose. But uh, again, I have um, uh, one or two books here that are very heavy, and I'm going to use those because once I apply the cement, I need something to hold it, and that should be more than enough weight. And this, these, these cements dry really fast, so and they don't have water. I don't like using water-based glues. Some of the carpenter, gl carpentry glues are, you know, the, the glues that you can wash up with water. They may work. They may work fine for a lot of things, but I'm really trying to avoid any moisture here as, as much as possible. Okay, so I've got my little uh, metal piece here that I'm going to use. And I want to take, one of the reasons I have my rubbing alcohol here is I'm going to take my, uh, I think this is, yeah, paper towel, and I'm just going to clean this off. Because remember, any oil, grease, or dirt um, is the, uh, is going to be a problem for your for your glue, your cement, or anything that you're applying, paints, varnishes. You never you want you basically don't want any dirt or dust, and your job is more likely to succeed. Now, let's see. What I would like to do, I'm going to go to my cement here. I'm going to set this up. I'll set this. I have an envelope <coughs> protecting my book here. And I'm just going to put some of the uh, cement. This stuff dries quickly, so I need to, I don't want to put too much out here because then I'll just be wasting it. But I'm going to use this as mostly just as an over uh, overflow thing. I don't want to have cement dripping all over the place. I'll just leave that here for a moment. Now, um, one of the things I'd like to do is, is get over in this area right here. Now, I need something to lift this with, and so I'm going to take, I'll take this to, to lift just to get my piece under here. And I'm basically going, now go, I'm going as far back as the veneer will bend, and that's it. I don't want to force it. I could try to go further back, but that's, that's not going to be, uh, I don't think that would be wise. So, then I'm going to take one of my cotton swabs that I dipped in my uh, alcohol. Remember, alcohol is very, very powerful and can mess with your, uh, your varnishes and your stains, so be extra careful with it. I only used a little bit here, and what I'm doing is basically I want to clean up any excess cement that oozed out after I put this in here. And then my next, my next uh, area that I want to apply cement is going to be over in this loose area that I was showing you earlier. And again, because this glue is solid based, it's going to dry really fast. So I'm over here working on it. And I can even bend this clasp if I want to get a little bit of a, might make it easier for me to get it down in here. And again, some of the glue may, uh, it may kind of form an edge on here, but that's okay because, I, again, I have the alcohol to clean it up. And again, I don't want to dally and, and you know, I want to move relatively quickly while the glue is, still has a lot of its uh, you know, wetness to it or solvent in it. And again, when you're coming back in here, use your judgment. Don't push too hard because you don't want to lift anything off that was that was sound, right? This side I've already checked with my finger and it's fine. So, now that I've got this pretty well, uh, pretty well wet with the cement, I'll go back over here on the little corner edge and give a little bit more. Now, uh, my next move is, let's get a different cotton swab here. I'm just going to press down, and you'll see it. Yeah, now remember that that veneer has has a has some tension to it. It's going to want to pop up. That's why we really need to have the uh, the the weight of the books on there. And I've just come along, taking any excess off to avoid the sticking. 
And basically now I'm just going to take my books and I'm going to put them right there. And that should give me plenty of weight. Now I can add more weight if I want. I can add a few more books. There's no harm in that. And I'm going to let this dry. I'll probably just leave the books on here for a half an hour or so. Uh, this stuff dries uh, contact pretty quickly. And, but, you know, I would give it the extra time. We've got a little, little higher humidity today. And of course, humidity affects drying times of things like glues and paints. So we'll give it a little more time and uh, maybe put a couple of more books on here just to add a little bit more weight. And that really should do it. That really should be all we need. Now there's that one area on, uh, on this, this uh, upper side and I'm going to go ahead and do this and then I'll check that one to make sure if it if, if I think I can get to it and make it a little more sound, I will. But basically, once this procedure is over, the next step is going to be um, how to trace out and cut a piece of this veneer. And again, I'm going to uh, do this for the first time. You guys will see me. But again, I want to do this now before I go to uh, put... Um, the, the Howard's Restore a Finish, I don't want to use it until after I've made this veneer repair. Because once I, once I use the Howard's, the Howard's has, it has solvent, but it has oils in it. And the oils would cause my, my new veneer pieces that I'm going to be filling in, they wouldn't stick as well. So I want to go ahead and get the veneer repair done first. Once that's dried, uh, we're going to do some filling in of any areas that... Uh, any gaps between the old and the new veneer, and then it'll be time to go back with the Howards and uh, and uh, see what she looks like. So stay tuned, everyone. This is something I wanted to do. I'm going to be getting ready to overhaul the uh, the 201 that is hiding in this in this good old cabinet. And but before I did, I wanted to use this cabinet as an example because if I use uh, the Restore Finish and other products on a cabinet that looks beautiful, it's hard to appreciate the difference. And again. This is about conserving and sort of refreshing things without stripping them and uh, completely refinishing them, which is not, which is not something that interests me uh, in the context of this sewing machine channel. So anyway, uh, some of you may have wondered what happened to this cabinet and if it ever got finished, but now I wanted to show the veneer uh, and how, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it, how it goes. It may finish beautifully and uh, for very little money, because I have found that the more I work to conserve and restore, to, to, re, to recondition the items that I, uh, that I offer to people, whether it's a machine or a table, people tend to take care of things a little bit better when they're in better shape. I don't know why that is, but, but it just seems to be that way. Uh, at least that's what I've found. Anyway, if any of you have any experience repairing veneers on uh, furniture of any kind, whether it's a sewing table or otherwise, leave your comments down below and uh, stay tuned. I'll be making a video when I get ready for the next stage of repairing this, uh, this wonderful mahogany sewing table that just needs some TLC and it will be looking beautiful once again. Thanks for watching everybody.